We're in this series called, uh, just really simply, The Holy Spirit. And what we're doing is studying and, and taking a look at the person, this third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And really, just I, what I'm hoping to do is get you a little bit more comfortable with who he is and maybe who you were told he was or, or, or what he does, even in, in our life. And just maybe if we kind of take a blank page approach and look at the Word of God, we, be, we would become a lot more comfortable with who he is in our, in our lives. So our theme verse is in Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, and this, this uh, book of Acts is the historical record of the early church, the first church, and, and we're, we're now in Acts 19, it's towards the end of this, uh, this book after a whole bunch of people are already getting saved, and here it is, Acts 19, 1 and 2, it says, Apollos was at Corinth, and Paul, he was in Ephesus, and there he found, it says, notice with me, some disciples. So these were followers of Jesus. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And I want you to notice that these were believers. These were disciples. And and so they had, and and we know that when you accept Christ, you you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. But Paul still is asking them about something else. He says, look, I know you're a Christian. I know you're a believer. I know you're a disciple. I know you have the Holy Spirit, but living inside of you. But this is something else. Like, have you received the Holy Spirit, when you believed, and they said what a lot of people say today, no, we have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why we're doing this series is because a lot of people know about God the Father. Some people aren't even Christian. They know about Father God. And, and, and so that's, that's a kind of like a more of an understandable thing for people. And a lot of people know about God the Son, about Jesus Christ. And there was even, there's a lot of movies that's been produced about him. So people know about God the Son. They know about God the God. Uh, the Son, Jesus Christ, but not a lot of people know about this third person of the, of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I love doing is bringing to you biblical truth in a simple way so that all of us can understand it. And I love even redefining things that have not been defined, you know, right, you know, and we, we, we mix things up and misunderstand it. So last week was all about that. We just, we redefine spirit. So with the, the, the name of that third person, the Trinity, Holy Spirit, that word spirit, um, some of your Bible says ghost. Like, what's all that about? He's not, and what we discovered is that he's not a ghost at all. Like, he's not spooky. He's not weird. He's in like some, he's known to be like weirded out. That word literally means wind, a blast of air. Like, like we found out he is a breath of fresh air in our life. Like he's wind in our sails. He's he's refreshing and powerful, and he's no one to be afraid of. He's no one to be resisted. Like like he's here to help us is what we discovered. That Jesus actually sent him to earth to live inside of every one of us because Jesus is not here anymore. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he sent us the Holy Spirit to help us. That's what we talked about last week. And if you missed that, please go check it out. You can watch it or listen to it online or on our app, um, just to get kind of caught up in who the Holy Spirit is. And looking at his name, it reveals his characteristics. So go check that out. Today, we're going to unpack another, uh, I think, another part of, of the Holy Spirit that there's a lot of misunderstanding about and maybe even some cu- confusion, and that is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the gifts of of the Spirit. We're going to talk about that today. Because when when the Holy Spirit was given and poured out, He came bearing gifts. Amen? That we have, we are now gifted by God through the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says, a spiritual gift is given to who? To each of us. Every single one of us, the Bible says, has a spiritual gift so we can help each other. Isn't that cool? Like, Like Jesus sent the helper, like the Holy Spirit to, to help us and to be with us. And so he now gives us gifts so that we can be like God in this matter and help people. Isn't that so cool? Isn't that just like God to like give us an ability to help others? You say, Jason, what happened? Why is there so much confusion though with these spiritual gifts? One of the reasons why there's a lot of confusion today is because there's just different, there's different theological ideas and religions and, and, and thoughts about spiritual gifts. There's one one school of thought was that the, the spiritual gifts ceased. They actually stopped when all the dis- apostles died. That's one, one thought of, of, of religion or Christendom. They say, you know what? When the apostles died, 
there's no need for any more uh, of the gifts. And there's actual term for that if you want it. The term is cessationism, cessationism. And that's where that's, people believe that the gifts ceased. They ceased to be, they ceased to operate, they ceased to be poured out on, on the church after the apostles. And there's only one problem with that, and that is it's not in the Bible, okay? It just, it's just not true. It's not, it's, in fact, the Bible says actually as, as the, the day draws closer to Christ's return, that, that, that there would be a greater measure of, of, of anointing and gifts poured out that, that everyone, sons and daughters and young and old, would see dreams and visions and prophesy. And it's just, so it just doesn't line up with the Bible. And the reason why there's a lot of confusion, let's get, let's get real, okay? Because there is, it's not even really about all the gifts that people are a little bit confused or skeptical about. Because no one, no one gawks are about the gift of serving or the gift of teaching. That's cool, that's cool. But it's, it's these other category of gifts that we call the Bible calls the manifestational gifts or the power gifts. So we talk about word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy, like miracles and healing, or tongues and interpretation of tongues. And so, like, I'm cool with the gift of service, Pastor, gift of mercy and stuff, but don't you, don't you be talking about no tongues up in here, okay? And, and so here's what I would just say about this, okay? Here's what I would say, because I'm not, it's not the topic today. I, I will address this in future teachings. We've got two more weeks. I'm actually going to be talking about Pentecost and what that means, the actual Pentecost and, and why the Holy Spirit was poured out the way he was and, and what does that mean. And we're going to talk about the fullness of the Spirit later. And, and so we're going to address some of these. What I want to just say today, which by the way, a lot, I think a lot of us are going to have to re, readjust our understanding and, and our definitions of what that is. But let me just say today, do not disparage anything that God gives just don't, 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 any, any gift, anything that is of God, anything that's in his word that he calls good for you, a gift, don't disparage that. Don't stiff arm God in any area. I'm just Amen. like pursue it. Go after God. Go after his gifts. First Peter chapter four, verse 10 says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. That's the purpose. Let me, let me kind of highlight that just for a moment. The, the reason why God has given you a spiritual gift is not for you to promote yourself. It's not for your own benefit or your own enjoyment. Although it does, it's enjoyable to be used by God. I'm not saying it isn't. Like it's, it is. It's fulfilling to be used by God. But the reason why he gave you gifts and has given us gifts is so that we can serve others. And Jesus was the example in this. In Matthew 20, 28, Jesus says, your attitude must be like my own. For I did not come to be served, but to serve. That's why. So, so what you need to know is if you, are, if you are a Christian, if you're a believer and you've crossed that line of faith, what you need to know is it's not about you. It's not. It's ceased. Like, like you actually are dead. You are dead in Christ. The life you live now, you live in Christ. That's, and that's, and that is, if you are a Christian, it's not about you. Your attitude must not be your own. He says, I did not come to be served, but to serve others. So because the Holy Spirit has given us and empowered us and, and, and you know, gifted us to, to serve others, and, and, it, and Christ said, you know what, this is the, you need to be like me and serve others. Here's my working definition of a spiritual gift today. This is kind of where we're going today. Write this down. A spiritual gift is a special supernatural ability. Now, don't get all freaked out on that supernatural world, Okay. Because natural would be, your, your spiritual gift is not your natural talents. It's not your natural abilities. It is, it's of God, therefore it is supernatural, okay? Supernatural ability that God gives to his children, check this out, to serve like Jesus. See, that's a, see God, God wants you to, to look like, to live like, and to serve like Jesus. That is the goal of your life, is to be conformed to the image of of his son. To be, to be Christ-like is the goal and the journey that every single one of us is on. And so God gives us gifts and pours out gifts in our lives so that we can serve like Jesus. Now, there are parts of my life, there's parts of your life, when I look at them, I'm like, man, sometimes it just doesn't look like Jesus. Are you in agreement, you guys? Everyone here, we always don't look like Jesus in every area of our life, but there is an area the Bible says for every single one of us where the Holy Spirit has gifted, he's placed his anointing, his grace on where you look like Jesus most in that area. 
Wow, that, you, you look like Jesus, you live like, like you serve like Jesus in that area most right there. Now, the reason why this is, again, kind of confusing for, for the church today is because in, in the Old Testament, another reason, the Old Testament, um, there was only a, a certain people group that were anointed, that were able to do ministry, you know, that were, that were, that were able to serve God in that, in that way, and they were called the priests. And so the, the priests were able to go into the temple and to go into the Holy of Holies behind the curtain, and they would make intercession for God's people. But something happened on Calvary when Jesus says, it is finished, if you've read the Gospels. When Jesus said, it is finished, and cried aloud, the Bible says the earth shook, and the veil in that temple that separated all the ordinary people like me and you from God's presence, the Bible says that veil was ripped in two, and the Spirit of God burst out of that place. And now now indwells all of God's people. You are anointed. You are, you are called to the ministry. You are called to serve God. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And not only, in fact, not only has it not stopped, God's gift hasn't stopped. He said in John 14, he said, man, you're going to do even greater things, Jesus said. You're going to do even greater things because I'm going to the Father and I'm about to send the Holy Spirit with power into your lives to accomplish what I've called you to accomplish. You were created to serve God. And the Holy Spirit gives us the power, the ability, the gifts to serve God. And I'll tell you why this is so important because so many people, they're looking for self-esteem. So many people are looking for significance and they're looking for self-worth and they're always trying to feel good about themselves. And what can, I do to, what can I do to make myself feel good and feel affirmed? And they're always trying to do things to prop up their self-esteem. They're looking in the wrong place. You can't find your self-esteem in status because there's always going to be someone higher up on the, on the pole than you. And you can't find your self-esteem in your salary because no matter how much you make, someone's always going to be making a little bit more than you. You can't find your self-esteem in success because there's always going to be someone who's achieved something other or more than you. The Bible actually says that your self-esteem comes through serving. That's what it says. It comes through service. Jesus said it this way. You, you live when you die. When you lay down your life, you actually live. You find it. If you give your life away, that's where you find meaning and significance. It's in serving that we find it. And I'm telling you, the greatest thrill of your life is when you're being used by God with the gifts and the power that he has given you in the Holy Spirit. That's the greatest thrill of your life to be used by God. So here's what I want to do. I want to help us uh, to teach us today how to learn to serve like Jesus, because that's why you've been gifted. That's why he's poured it out. Now, for those of you that don't know your gift, you don't know like, like what spiritual gift, and it's still, you answer kind of like Acts 19 people, like, oh, I didn't know about this stuff here. It, here's, here's my thought. Like, if I can teach you how, to, how to, to learn to serve like Jesus, you may just, by serving like Jesus, you may just stumble upon your gift, okay? And for the, some of you that do know your gift, what I'd like for you to do is do a little heart check today because it's really easy to make your gifts about something or someone else other than glorifying Jesus and being conformed into him, his image. And so I'd like to do both of those things because this is the reason why the gifts of God have been poured out. And there's even some barriers to flowing in the spirit and allowing the spirit of God to use you. And we're going to identify those together. Then at the end, what I want to do is just give you some really easy steps that all of us can take in this area of our spiritual gifts. So, so let's do this. Let's learn to serve like Jesus together. That's why the Holy Spirit was poured out into our lives. Let's learn to serve like Jesus. Write some notes with me. Serving like Jesus means first, being available. It means being available. We gotta make ourselves available to be used by God. <clears throat> One day, Jesus was walking down the street and he was going to Jericho and, and two blind men, Matthew chapter 20, two blind men shouted out to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us. And I love what Jesus did. Jesus stopped. Some people like to study the steps of Jesus. I like to study the stops of Jesus. Jesus stopped and he said, what would you want me to do for you? If you look at the New Testament, you study all the places, it says Jesus stopped. What you're going to find out is most of Jesus' ministry, most of Jesus' miracles happened during interruptions. It happened when Jesus was on his way to do something else, to go somewhere else, and, 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 and something interrupted, someone interrupted. You, and you know why Jesus, Jesus uh, did miracles in ministry when he was interrupted? Because he loves people. 
That's why. Because he, he loves people. And you look at it, all the, the blind beggar, the lame man, the sick woman, the bent back, the dead child, the deaf, almost all of them were interruptions. In fact, Jesus' first miracle, you remember that? He was interrupted at a wedding he was partying at. You know what I mean? That's, he was interrupted there. So here's the point. If you want to be used by God, and if you want the gifts of the Spirit to flow in your life, you got to be willing to be interrupted. you got to get up in the morning and say, okay, God, here's my agenda. Here's my to-do list. But God, I'm open to do whatever you want. You send whoever you need to send to in my life. You bring, you bring whatever need needs to be presented in my life. There's someone in need you want me to deal with. I'm open, God. I'm available because I'm here to serve you, not check things off my to-do list. So God, I invite you. I invite you to bring interruptions and I won't be irritated by them. I'll see them as, you know how you know if, you're, if you have a servant's heart? How do you handle the interruptions of life? Are you irritated by them? Or do you see them as an opportunity to serve? Notice Proverbs 3.28. says, never tell your neighbor to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. God says, if you can do it now, help them now. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. Servant-hearted people are spontaneous. Servant-hearted people are sensitive. They look around and they say, here's a need. I'll deal with it now. Oh, there's a need. I have a solution. I'll go ahead and take care of that myself. That's what servant-hearted people do. What is it that keeps us from being available to God? What is it that keeps uh, us from allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through our lives and being available to God? Uh, Let me identify some barriers. These are really important for us to identify. Here's the first one, and that is self-centeredness. We have this self focus. I'm just too caught up in my own plans, my own desires, my own dreams, my own goals, my own objectives and ambitions, and I really don't have time for God's plan in my life. I don't have time to help other people. I'm too busy. I'm in a hurry. I can't help any, anybody else. People, you know what I, I've noticed? People don't mind serving God. If I talk, ask any, any believers, say, you want to serve God? Amen. Sir, they'll love to serve God. But when they find out that serving God is serving people, there's a problem. That's, it. That's, that's how you serve God, in the interruptions of life, in serving people. But we're so self-focused. Look at Philippians 2.4. I love the message paraphrase. He says, forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Turn to your neighbor and say, forget yourself. Come on. <laughs> I'm telling you, after, after a message, yeah, some of, you, some of you didn't like that. What are you talking about? Forget you. Um. After a message like this, I promise you, God's going to test you. I promise you, just, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see something. He's going to put something across your path, and I'm telling you, it's a test. It, it might be even later today. It could be tomorrow. It could be during the week. But there's gonna, something is going to cross your path, and it's not going to be your plan, your agenda. It's, it's going to be something. It's, it's going to be maybe a need. A need is presented and it ain't your interest. It ain't your desire, but you know the solution and you, and, and, and you could, and, and God, I'm telling you, it's a test. God is saying, are you, are you here for me? Are you? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to be self-focused? Here's the second barrier to being available to the Holy Spirit and serving like Jesus. And that is, this is a big one, perfectionism. Perfectionism says, I'm going to wait till it's just right, till I get, or just just perfect, and then I'll start serving. Then I'll get involved, you know, in that ministry stuff. One of these days, when my kids are grown up, right, when I got more time, when, when, I, when I'm retired, or when I'm, it's just, it's just, real servants, listen, real servants do what they can with what they have for Jesus Christ today. They don't wait. They don't, wait. They, they, they don't make excuses. They do it now. They don't wait for a perfect time. Look at Ecclesiastes 11 and 4. I love this. It says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. You don't want to testify about that, right? How many times have we just waited and waited and waited for the, and it just never happened? We said, oh, when things slow down. Come on, man. It's never going to slow down. It's called life. It just keeps going and going and going. There's never going to be a per- and by the way, it doesn't have to be perfect for God to bless it. That's why some of you are waiting. You're waiting for, because you're, you're not skilled enough or gifted enough, or you don't have enough time. Well, do you have some time? 
You got a little bit of time. Just, just and, and so it doesn't have. It just, good enough is sometimes good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect for God to bless it. Look, and if God, if it had to be perfect for God to bless it, God wouldn't be able to bless anything. If, if God only, if God only used perfect people, what would get done? Nothing. If God only used perfect circumstances, what would get done? Nothing, because God uses normal, ordinary people for extraordinary things when they have the power of the Holy Spirit and gifted by him. That's why, not perfect conditions, it's normal people. Here's the third barrier, and that's materialism. Materialism, let me get up in your business now. Materialism keeps us from serving God because from being available, we get so busy taking care of things that we just forget to take care of people. And you got to decide in life, you, you either are going to um, live for greed or you're going to live for God. Because you can't do both, you guys. Am I going to be a kingdom builder or am I going to be a wealth builder? You cannot do both. You can't have two number one priorities. If your number one priority is to make a lot of money or is it your number one priority to serve God? Look what Jesus said in Luke 16. No servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve, not should not. He didn't make it an option. He said, it's impossible. But you cannot serve both God and money. Now, if God wants to make you wealthy and rich, praise God, God bless you. But it better not be your number one priority and your number one goal. Because when you get to heaven, God is not going to say, hey, let's see that bank account. How'd you do? Right? Right? God is going to say, what did you do with the talents I gave you? I gave you some things. I gave you some gifts. How did you, how did you handle your life? How did you steward those things that I gave you? The gifts that I gave you. Serving like Jesus means being available. Here's the second thing serving like Jesus is like. It's, it means being grateful. Gratitude is a, is a, is a very powerful um, tool, instrument, that actually can, can just promote the anointing, the power of God in someone's life, it, being grateful. Jesus lived in this constant attitude of gratitude. He had, a, he had the habit of thanking God in advance for the things that he was going to do. Like he didn't, not afterwards, like after God performed and did, Jesus thanked God in advance before it happened. One time Jesus went down to see his friend Lazarus and people were thinking they were going to his, he was going to his funeral. And because he had died, but Jesus was going for ministry. Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus does something really cool. He prays this prayer in, Luke, in John chapter 11. Um, how he had, look how he had the, some gratitude in advance. He says, Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He hadn't even spoke a word yet over Lazarus. But I thank you, God, because you've heard me already. You've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here. See, Jesus could have prayed that silently, but he prayed it out loud so that we could even today be reading the example of gratitude in Jesus' life that he had. And you might think, well, I'd be grateful too if I could raise people from the dead. <laughs> but you're missing the point here, you guys. The point is Jesus was able to do miracles in ministry because he was grateful in advance. See, that's where miracles come from when you're serving God and the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes when you have gratitude in advance for the provision. Amen, Amen somebody? Amen. What are some things that keep us grateful, that rob us of our gratitude, some barriers here of why, we're not, why, the, whole, why the gifts of the Spirit aren't able to flow in our life? Here are some barriers. Number one, comparing and criticizing. That just robs us of gratitude when I compare myself with others, when I criticize others. It just sucks the, the gratitude out of my life. Look what Romans 14 says when it comes to service. He says, who are you to criticize someone else's servant? Who are you to point a finger at, at them? You, who are you? That's not your servant. That's someone else's servant. The Lord will determine whether his servant has been successful. We are all God's servant. It's really just ridiculous when you think about it. We're all serving on the same team. We're all serving the same God for the same goal. And we all, he's all, he's given us all different abilities and different gifts. No one has all of them, but together we form the body of Christ and glorify his name together. And we live in the most incredible place in the world with all these opportunities, honestly. And, and yet 
Every one of us, because we compare ourselves with other people around us, robs our gratitude. The gratefulness, the thankfulness is stolen from our lives, so don't compare. It steals gratitude. Here's the second barrier. Wrong motives is a barrier to serving like Jesus with gratitude. Wrong motivations. Um, Jesus talked about this in Matthew 6, 1, realizing here that we can even serve God. We can do good things from the wrong motivation. Matthew 6, 1 says, when you do good deeds, don't try to show off if you do, you won't get a reward from your Father in heaven. So let's just admit it, you guys. A lot of serving is self-serving. It is. Sometimes we, we, we serve and we want people to see us serving. Or we serve because we want people to like us or to accept us. Or we serve because, because we, want, we, we want something in, in return. Or even from God, we say, God, I'll take care of you. If you take care of this, I'll do this, God. If you do, if you do this in my life. Well, I'm, oh, look at me, I'm serving. Look how noble I am. We even try to do humble things, hoping that people will watch us being humble. Oh, look at me, I'm so humble. <laughs> just, just a servant, just serving to God. I hope someone sees this. It's just, the, it's just how easy it is for the human heart to just get sidetracked. But here's the problem with wrong motivations. They don't last. They can get you started in serving, but they will never keep you serving God. It's, it, it's the wrong motivation. God has given you the Holy Spirit because he wants you to do it the way Jesus did. He wants you to live like Jesus and serve like Jesus. And it's not by might or by power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. And here's this, this last area of what it means to be serving like Jesus. That means being faithful. Serving like Jesus, Jesus means being faithful. Faithful means you don't give up when you get discouraged. You don't give up when you get tired. You don't give up when you get hurt. You don't give up when you get criticized. You don't take your ball and go home, right? Because somebody didn't listen to me. Oh, they didn't listen to me. No, you serve. The rest of your life you serve. You are faithful. You are persistent. Jesus' entire ministry, he was criticized. Constantly he was criticized. Yet at the end of his ministry, he was able to say in John 17, to God the Father, he said, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Man, and that's, I want that so bad for you guys. I want you to get to that place where before God, you're standing and he, and he is able to say, great job. You completed the work. Like I gave you works. I even, I even gave you the, the gifts to accomplish the purpose. I gave you power to carry it out through my spirit. You completed the work I gave you to do. Serving, serving like Jesus means being faithful regardless. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, this one didn't make your outline, I don't think. Look up here on the screen. It says, the one thing required of servants is that they be talented. No, it doesn't say that, huh? God doesn't care about how, how much talent you have. He cares about your heart, all right? The one thing required of a servant is that you're faithful, not that you do it perfectly, not that you do it terrifically, not that you're even successful at it. He just, he says, the one thing's required is that you keep doing it and doing it and doing it. You're just faithful. You don't give up. You keep at it. That's the one thing required of a servant. You are faithful. So how do we do it then? How do we, how do we discover the spiritual gift? What my encouragement to you today is just to jump in. Just that I'm telling you that, that this part of God is for you. The spiritual gifts are for you. So what do you do? Number one, jump in and discover the gifts that God has given you. Discover the gifts. You got you to go on a discovery, church, because they're not going to be all that obvious. Because again, they're not natural abilities. They're not your natural talents or not even necessarily your natural strengths. Look at Romans 12 and 6. It says we have different gifts gifts according to the grace given us. There's a variety of gifts, and so you got to go on this exploration of all the different kind of gifts that the Bible says. And I personally, personally believe that the gifts in the Bible that are stated were not meant to be an exhaustive list. I believe that God is continuously, constantly pouring out new gifts to his church to meet the needs of every generation. He's constantly pouring out gifts. you got to discover what those gifts are. And by the way, this word gift right here, the, the Greek word for gift is charisma. 
And the word grace is charis. Charis. So you ever, you ever wonder, that's where we get the word charismatic. So, you know, some people think, when you think of charismatic, you think of, of you know, dancing with snakes or something like that. So I don't know what you, or, or, or you get the whole like either wearing too much makeup or no makeup at all kind of thing when you think of charismatic. That's not what it means at all, okay? What charismatic just means is grace gift. Is you have, you have a grace gift, and it just comes natural to you. It's, it's, it's just, it's the place in your life where you are most like Jesus, where you just are able to glorify him in that, in that space. It comes natural to you. There's an anointing on it when you operate in that area. Like when, when I'm up here and I'm talking to you guys, it's easy for me. It wasn't always easy. I used to be scared to speak in front of you. I was terrible, terrified and terrible at speaking in front of people. And there was other areas in my life that I was no good at. But once I came to Christ, there was an anointing and grace put on my life. There's people have grace gifts that, that he, some people are serving in, in music or, or in, as a technician or even in kids ministry. They're loving on kids and praying with kids and they actually understand what the people are saying. Uh, you guys don't want me in kids ministry. I need duct tape and a chair to be in, in kids ministry. There was this, there was this, you know, somebody like, oh, Pastor. no, one time, seriously, it's just not my gift. One time I was, when I first started in, in ministry, I was just serving and, and we were doing an after school program and it was for kids. It was all the kids, the bad kids that get kicked out of the after school program, which are after school program. Just loving on these kids, helping them with homework, feeding them. And then we would do a devotion. And I did the devotion one day. And man, I'm killing it, man. I'm giving a devotion, dude. I'm just, I'm just. And then at the end, there was this little kid, this little, little he must have been like six years old. And he raised his hand. And, and I say, I'm like, yeah, question. It was after, you don't have a question. And I say, yeah, well, young man, what's your question? He said, were you speaking English? Grab your hot dogs, kids. Let's just, let's just, because it's, listen, here's the point. I, I, I found my grace gift. I mean, they found their grace gift. You need to find your, you need to discover the gift of God, the grace that is upon your life. And here's what, what you're going to discover is that, that um, God did not only create your height and your hair color and your eye, eye color. He created, look what Psalms says here. Psalm 139. It says, for you created my inmost being, like the innermost part of me, the part of me that loves what I love, cries about what I cry about, laughs at what I laugh about, like God, you did that. You put that inside of me. Like, like for some of you that have the gift of service, you, you came into a room like this and you saw chairs that need to be straightened or trash that need to be picked up. And for others, like with the gift of mercy or the gift of encouragement, you came in here and you probably saw someone who's a little discouraged or maybe sitting by themselves. And that's what you saw when you came in. Two totally different people, the same room. God did that. You, you see, you interpret life through the lens of your spiritual gift. He says, you created my in, innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And of course, men do that. Men, men look in the mirror and they, they do that. Women look in the mirror and they see, they see something wrong every time they look in the mirror. Men look in the mirror. He could have been beat with the ugly stick. He's like, yeah, what's up, man? Oh, you looking good today. And this is David like, oh, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Like, God, you did good. God. You wonderful, although your works are wonderful. But then he says this last line, which maybe you cannot say. And then he says this, and I know that. Like I know it full well. I know it. And that's why you need to take the next step because you don't know. And we created this, these next step classes. Step two in, in our next step classes is all about discovering. Your, we'll, we'll give you a spiritual gift survey. In that class, you take a spiritual gift survey, a personality profile survey, and you figure out what God has given you, what God has put inside you. This is how we like to say it here. It's not in your outline, but up here on the screen, God's design in me reveals God's destiny for me. That's what you're going to discover. And so you might ask, well, when is, when is step two? Today, 430. Isn't that a coincidence, you guys? God's design in me reveals God's destiny for me. And then after we discover that, we can get busy with number two, which is to develop the gifts that God has given me. 
to develop. Here's something you guys, you guys need to know. Maybe you don't know this. Is that your, your spiritual gifts can change and mature over time. They can. Your gifts. God can give you new gifts or new assignments, new anointing and grace for new assignments, and they even can mature over time. So when you first come to Christ, maybe you were an outgoing person, kind of a hospitable person. You can make people feel at ease. And so you said, well, perfect. First impressions is great for me because I like people. And you shake some hands or you give out a sermon note and you're doing a great job giving, making people feel welcomed and at ease. But as you grow and mature in the things of Christ, you start seeing your potential in Christ and the power he's placing. And you say, man, I think, I, I think there's, there's even more. I can, I can open up my home. I can start a small group. I can invite people in and make them feel comfortable and do life together. And I can be an example for them to follow Christ as I'm following Christ. Your gifts can change and mature. Over time, that's why 1 Corinthians 14 says, follow the way of love. So let that always be the motivation. And look at this, and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. You see, you don't, you don't, don't look down on them. Don't disparage them. Don't be afraid of them. The Bible actually says to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. In one translation, it actually says covet, like covet the spiritual gifts. Look at them and go, and go, oh God, if you were to give me that gift, I would love to serve you and be like you in that area. If you would only give me that gift, oh, it would be great, God, if I could serve you with that gift. And some of you, you know what it is, but your gift has gone dormant. And it's just, it hasn't been on, and maybe it was life circumstances happen, or you got busy, or just things just, just, just happened and pulled you away from being used by God and his power, and the gift that you have. And, and, and if that is, can I just tell you, can I, don't give up on your dream. Don't, don't give up on the gift that God has given you. Don't give up on the, the destiny that God has for you. And that's why I want to remind you today, like Paul reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy, to fan into flame. Like that's what I hope. I hope today there's just a spark rising. I'm just, I'm just trying to fan into flame the what? The gift of God like that's already in you. It's in you. It's already in you. I'm just trying to get a spark going today so that we can do this last one, which is what it's all about. Number three, and that is to use the gifts God has given me. To use them. Now, before you stir, put everything away. Listen, listen. You, if you um, don't know Jesus today, you don't know Christ as far as, as far as a personal relationship with him, your whole life, listen, your whole life is about discovering who Jesus is. And so, and so God is working in your life. He's orchestrating things. He's, he's putting circumstances and people and things, and he's trying, to, he's trying to bring revelation to you. And even like while you're here today, if you don't know Christ, the, your whole, the, what God is trying to do is help you discover who Jesus is. That's your whole meaning in life before Jesus. Now listen, listen. After Jesus, for those of you that know Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, your whole life, the reason why you exist can be summed up in one statement right here. To use the gifts that God has given you. That's the whole purpose of when you are called, when all of us stand before God. That is what we will be asked of. What did you do with the time, the talents, the treasures that I gave you? First Peter chapter 4.10 says that God has given gifts to each of you from his great variety of spiritual gifts. So here's the assignment. Here it is. Manage them well. Like steward them. He's given them to you. Are you stewarding them? Are you managing them well? So that God's generosity, I love this, can flow through you. See, God wants to flow through you, church. He wants, to, he wants to, you to serve like Jesus. And this is my prayer. My constant prayer for you is, is to lead you in such a way as your pastor that, that ensure I want your life here on earth to be good and I want it to be better and I want you to, to have more access to the things of God, the mind of God, the provision of God. Sure, here on earth, absolutely. But honestly, my goal is, is not to make your life here on earth better. My ultimate goal is to get that place when you stand before God that he would say this, well done. Well done. Good and faithful. What? What? servant. You were created to serve God. He gave you gifts, supernatural abilities, gifts to serve like Jesus. Well done, good 
and faithful. Like you didn't give up. You didn't always win. You didn't always succeed. You didn't always do it right. Sometimes even you had the wrong heart, but you were faithful. You were faithful. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You had been faithful with a few things. I gave you some gifts. I didn't give you all of them. I gave you some, a few things, but you were faithful with that I gave you. So now I'm going to put you in charge of many things. I got so much more for you. Come and share in your master's happiness. That's my goal for you. Come on, let's bow our heads all across this worship center.